Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Leslie Hogart from the Open University, and I'm going to kick off this third and final presentation. Where's the So we're introducing a little bit of a comparative element here, um, and I'm going to look at women's experiences of abortion in, in Britain, and then um, Professor Sally Sheldon is going to look at issues over Northern Ireland and Ireland. So to start off with, what I'm going to do is to talk you through some issues from um, a research study in Britain that finished about just over a year ago. I'm not going to dwell here on the methodology of that study. Um, I'm just going to tell you that this was a well-designed study. It was very robust. It was externally and independently scrutinized, and it passed all the relevant ethical approvals. If anybody's got any methodological questions, obviously they can ask me afterwards. So what I'm going to concentrate on is just two of the findings here. As you can imagine, this was quite a large study, so we have a lot of findings. I could spend a long time talking to you about them, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pick out two of the findings of particular relevance to the discussion that we're having today. And those are findings around abortion stigma that has already been raised, um, and findings around women's experiences of medical abortion, the abortion pill. Um, and there is a connection between these two sets of findings. First of all, though, um, just, a, just a, a few quantitative results. I'm going to be drawing on qualitative research when I talk to you about stigma and medical abortion. But I think before I start, it's worth pointing out something that those of us who do research in abortion know and understand and take for granted, and that is that it's actually not so easy not to become pregnant when you don't want to be. Um, so most of the women in our study were using contraception, um, but for one reason or another, the contraception had failed for them. Um, I suspect most of us probably know, I certainly know people who've become pregnant when they didn't want to be. Um, sometimes that's welcome and embraced, other times it's not. So the women we're talking about in our study are women who became pregnant when they didn't want to be. They were unintentionally pregnant, and that pregnancy was not welcome to them. As people have mentioned previously, the jurisdiction in Britain is different, it's very much more liberal, but abortion is still very controversial. Um, so in that situation, what women will face is abortion stigma. So a very broad definition of abortion stigma, which I think does work very well, is a definition as a shared understanding that abortion is morally wrong and or socially unacceptable. Um, in our study, women did feel stigma to varying degrees. Many women shared this definition themselves. Um, many women who experienced abortion themselves. And I'm just going to look a little bit now in a bit more detail um, at some of the issues around abortion stigma. So stigma is voiced through expressions of shame and of blame. And I'm just going to give you a, um, a sense of some of the things that the women said to us. So um, women blame themselves. I'm going to read you out what somebody said to us um, in the research. So Natasha said, I just felt like a bit of a slapper. You're 18 and you're pregnant. That's disgusting to start with, you know, and I guess a few of my friends had done that and become pregnant and had children. And I was just thinking, like, what are you doing? And I, I did really judge them. And then I was there in the same boat, and I was so embarrassed. So Natasha had been using contraception, and she had actually used emergency contraception. Um, she still became pregnant, and she had an abortion. And here she's blaming herself for the situation in which she was in. Another example um, of women feeling shame, Laura said to us, every time I think about it, I feel ashamed of myself. And I think that's just because that's how it's seen, isn't it? It's seen as quite, like it's quite, I don't know, I don't know whether this is just my opinion, but quite like a shameful thing to do. 
So this sense of having done something wrong is internalized by, by many women, and this is very much associated with um, concealment, concealing the fact that they may have had an abortion. Now, in our study, most of the women who felt that they wanted to conceal their abortion actually selected to have a surgical abortion. Um, you can choose between a surgical or a medical abortion. But I just want to read you what I think is um, a very interesting quote about concealment and then also non-concealment. So Fern told us, I was more scared of if people found out what they think of me because society nowadays is terrible. A girl does one thing and she's got a name for life and it's just not fair. I was more scared about what people my own age were going to say. So here she's talking to us about concealing her pregnancy from people around her, concealing her abortion from people around her. But then she goes on to say, but all the people that I did tell, all my close friends that I did tell were all really supportive and I didn't expect that. I thought they'd all abandon me and they wouldn't want to know me anymore. So this, I think, is very interesting, that she's moved from a position of concealment to non-concealment, and she's talking about how beneficial that is for her. So in our research, we clearly identified that social support and non-concealment weakens abortion stigma and makes it very much more easy for women to deal with their position. OK. Finally, just to end up with why I think this is important for experiences of medical abortion. Uh, people have mentioned already that medical abortion is a very safe, effective form of abortion if the abortion pills come from a reputable supplier. However, there are side effects and some women struggle to deal with those side effects. In our study, the women talked to us about experiencing the side effects, feeling very ill, feeling in a great deal of pain, but these women were able to phone up the clinic. They were able to get support from people around them. Um, so although the side effects were difficult for them, the social support they had and their ability to go to the clinic and gain clinical advice and support was very important. So in other words, non-concealment was important for their well-being and for their health. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Sally. So I want to talk to you about um, a small part of a larger study that looked at the legal implications oh. of the availability of abortion pills for regulatory frameworks, both in settings where abortion is legal, um, looking at England, Wales and Scotland, and in situations where access to abortion is severely oh. legally restricted, looking at um, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, the research was primarily library-based, but I did also do a small number of interviews, 22 interviews, with key actors. And they were specifically de designed to allow me to find out more about what was happening on the ground in countries where um, abortion is illegal and the pills are in use. So I talked to um, members of Women on Web and Women Help Women, which are organisations that are involved in supplying abortion pills, um, to Northern Ireland. I talked to um, local activists who are supporting women. I talked to family planning associations and I talked to a small number of um, government officials. So what did I find about that? Well, the, the first thing to note is that historically um, robust data regarding the number of women who are using abortion pills in illegal settings has, for obvious reasons, been very limited. Um, what you can see, and Claire has already alluded to this, is a steady decline in the number of women from both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland who are accessing services in England and Wales. So you can see on the slide there that they've declined, um, for Northern, Northern Irish resident women, they've declined by um, around a third over the last 10 years. In the last month, however, we've had um, publication of the first robust data regarding the number of women on the island of Ireland who are using abortion pills. Um, Claire's already alluded to this as well. So Women on Web have now published data 
which confirms that over the six years to 2015, with 2015 being the last complete year, they treated um, over 5,500 women on the island of Ireland. Um, and they've noted a very steady increase in those, um, those figures over the years. So um, over 1,500 women on the island of Ireland in 2015 were sent abortion pills by that one organisation. Um, it's not possible to disaggregate that data and to say how many of those women live in the Republic and how many live in Northern Ireland. On the basis of population alone, you would expect that somewhere over a third of those women would be in Northern Ireland. Um, what my research allows me to do is to provide a little bit of context to that, because both Women on Web and Women Help Women told me that they were sending pills across the island of Ireland, across all demographics, across all age groups. Um, women Help Women don't release numbers of the, um, the pills which they supply to women um, for abortion. However, they did tell me that they were receiving daily requests from across the island of Ireland. So they are another significant supplier of abortion pills um, to women in Northern Ireland and women in the Republic. And those are just two groups who are supplying pills. Um, and we know something about them because they operate with quite a high level of transparency. Uh, there are any number of other, other um, organisations. If you Google Buy Misoprostol online, you will get millions of hits. And the top hits are all going to be organisations who want to sell you abortion pills. We know much less about them. We know very little about um, how many women from the island of Ireland are seeking to access pills that way. But we know that some women are. Um, we know very little about the quality of medication that's supplied by those groups. We know very little about the quality of information that's supplied with the pills. We know very little about what they're telling women to do in the event of complications. Um, what can we say about the experience of the women who are using these pills? Um, so the first thing to note is that Women on Web and Women Help Women offer a very specific kind of service. They agree to treat women um, who are suffering from unwanted pregnancies up to a limit of nine weeks. The woman fills out a consultation online which screens for contraindications. She is sent authentic medication from a um, reputable uh, regulated supplier in another country. She's given clear instructions for how to use um, those pills and she's told very clearly what to look out for and when she might need to seek medical, further medical treatment. So within the limitations of a telemedical service, this is a very safe service that's been offered. Um, it's important to note that caveat. So with a telemedical abortion service, the service stops at the moment that a miscarriage is provoked. Women need to be able to access local health care in the very small number of cases where something will go wrong, and they need to know when to, when to do that. But within those limitations, this is a very safe um, service. And we also now, now know with the publication of the Women on Web data last month that this is a service which is very acceptable to women on the island of Ireland. So the women who completed the service evaluation after using this service um, overwhelmingly um, said that they, they found it acceptable um, and they overwhelmingly said that they would recommend it to somebody else in the same situation. Um, we haven't as yet got any robust data which compares women's experience of using the pills illegally in um, Northern Ireland with the experience of using them legally elsewhere. And there's very important research currently being done at the University of Ulster which will speak to that, uh, to that gap. Um, so we know that this is a safe service. We know that women are saying that it's acceptable. However, in, particularly in light of the findings that Leslie's just talked about, I think it's important also to acknowledge that the illegality of home use is going to add to stigma and potentially feelings of isolation around, around that use. So there's two basic facts there that I think are significant um, for policymakers. The first one is that abortion pills are in use in Northern Ireland in numbers that are significant. Um, we know that, and particularly with the publication of the Women on Web data, I think that, that is now undeniable. The second fact that we know is that there is a clear disparity between the different organisations who will supply pills. 
Women on Web, Women Help Women um, operate transparently. They're operating using a received um, medical treatment protocol, which is uh, clinically evidenced to be extremely safe. They supply high quality information. They tell women what to do if something goes wrong. And they have data to uh, back up the safety of that, that service. Other regulators are not necessarily operating according to that model. They may not be sending authentic medication. They may not send anything once a woman has paid. And we know, we, we know very little about them and the women who are being treated by them. So on the basis of those two facts, what are the implications for policy? Um, well, the first thing to note is that the current criminal legal prohibitions on abortion are very weakly enforced in um, both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Now, it may be that we're at the beginning of a, a trend for that to change. So there's been one prosecution of a young woman who had... Um, self-induced determination using pills accessed online. There are um, at least two, and I'm told possibly three other cases in the, in the pipeline at the moment. Um, but it would still be absolutely impossible for those prohibitions to be enforced in anything other than a highly selective and inconsistent way. Um, because it's impossible to stop a small blister pack of pills being brought into a jurisdiction. And it's incredibly difficult to detect when that's been used, and it's even more difficult to prove when that's been used. So the criminal law prohibitions are never going to be able to end access to, um, to the use of abortion pills. Um, and one thing to note on attempts to block the importation of abortion pills as well is that those, any such attempts are much more likely to interrupt the flow of pills coming in from reputable suppliers than they are to be able to interrupt the supply of pills coming in from less scrupulous suppliers. And that's because um, Women on Web and Women Help Women work with uh, companies that comply with local pharmaceutical regulations. They, they ship the medications in a way that is um, packed very distinctively so as to be tamper-proof, and they are very readily identifiable. If you shut down that supply, um, you're going to find it much more difficult to shut down the supply of pills coming in from elsewhere, which may not be packaged so visibly because the manufacturers aren't complying with <laughs> local regulations, and if they're not complying with that local regulation, then possibly they're also much less likely to be sending authentic medication. Um, and if you do interrupt that supply, obviously you also have the possibility that you're delaying a woman who will seek a termination anyway, so she will be ending that pregnancy later, or um, possibly even women will be resort uh, resorting to more desperate means. Um, I think there's a case for making much better information available to women. So um, Claire, I think, also alluded to the fact that the most recent iteration of the DHSSPS guidance now recognises for the first time that abortion pills are in use in Northern Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland still hasn't done very much to make any kind of public official information available to, to women about abortion pills. And actually, if you look at the Republic, they've done an awful lot more um, to do that, but, but not always um, with the best quality of information. Um, where women aren't given that information from official sources, they're going to access it from unofficial sources. So that might be from the, the internet, it may be from friends, it may be within local communities. There's some very good quality information about abortion pills on the internet, but there's an awful lot of rubbish out there as well, and navigating your way through that is quite difficult. So there is a real gap there, I think, where um, policymakers within Northern Ireland could make a real difference, where official guidance could be um, issued, which would really tell women a lot more about, the, um, about abortion pills, about the, the safety levels and the risks of abortion pills and what they need to, to look out for. In that official information, I think it's very significant to avoid blanket claims that talk about the dangers of inauthentic medication um, and unsupervised use. Those blanket claims rely on a, a refusal to drill down and to be prepared to differentiate between the different kinds of suppliers out there. Um, that is misleading and I think it's disingenuous because that information is so publicly available now. There is a published clinical evidence base um, that demonstrates the safety of the service of women on web. There is an Austrian court judgment which demonstrates the, um, the safety of the service of women on web. Um, so I think it's 
wrong for policymakers and official guidance to rely on those blanket claims, and I think it's wrong for um, media reporting to rely on those, those blanket claims. Um, and finally, just to note that in, in uh, Northern Irish law, obviously, you have a um, criminal offence of failure to report a serious crime, and that is playing potentially a very pernicious role in this context as well. The public health argument would be to get women um, in to talk to their doctors, to talk to healthcare providers, to talk to family planning specialists, um, and to be able to talk openly about um, their decisions, about any problems that they're having. That specific provision in the criminal law is clearly playing a significant role in disincentivising um, full disclosure in that situation. Now, if the woman has accessed pills from Women on Web or Women Help Women, um, that probably isn't posing any clinical risks to her because she's presenting with a miscarriage or an infection after a miscarriage, and that will be treated in exactly the same way, whether that's a spontaneous miscarriage or an induced one. However, um, that is introducing deception into the medical relationship, and it's potentially increasing the anxiety of the woman who is already in an anxious situation. Thank you.